Hey, Isaac. Hey, Professor. I joined a little early because I have a couple questions if I could ask you. Sure, yeah. What's Some up? conceptual ones. Um, for for 442, um, is about, can we kind of go over like the, 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 the wave propagation? Just because I, I had a hard time kind of like understanding like what it what it is and like how it actually um like affects like the pressure like throughout, like throughout the body. Sure, sure. Yeah, let me let me connect my iPad and then we'll and then we'll talk about it. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So wave propagation. All right, so the, the whole idea with, with wave propagation and the reason why it's, it's kind of a thing in the cardiovascular system is that your, your blood vessels are, are flexible, right? So they're not, they're not rigid tubes. And so, um, you know, if we draw kind of a, a blood vessel like this, um, and if you remember kind of our, our, our analogy with wave propagation, that if you have kind of a flexible string and you send kind of a, a pulse, you kind of flick the string, kind of a pulse that kind of travels down the, the string. Uh, and the reason, you know, we have that pulse that, that travels down there is, you know, precisely because the fact that the string is flexible. And so like, if you, if you compare that, you say like you compare it to like a rigid object, like a pen or something, and you try to kind of flick it up, right? You don't see a wave that kind of propagates on, along the, along the pen because your pen is basically like a, it's a, it's a rigid object, basically. Um, you only see that just as a result of, 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 you know, flexibility in, in the vessel walls. Uh, so that I think that's that's kind of the first thing is you know the main yeah. the main reason you have that is is because the of the of the uh, flexibility so, like in our in terms of like our, our bodies so like whenever the heart pumps and like sends like you know blood throughout the, the body the vessels are gonna like propagate right because they're flexible exactly yep mm-hmm. okay yep mm-hmm. um, and then by itself you know if you kind of just think of a, a, a wave on a string you know sending a wave down you know it looks cool but you know at the end of the day it just kind of looks like that. Um, but where, where it really starts to affect things is when the wave actually hits, gets to the end of the, um, of the cardiovascular tree. So in other words, it hits the capillaries and then that wave will reflect and start bouncing back and start propagating back the other way. And so all the interesting things with wave propagation are actually in the interaction um, of the different waves. And so you have forward, you have waves that are going forward that are coming from the heart and you have waves that are coming back that reflected off the capillaries. And this is constantly happening because if you kind of feel your heartbeat, every time your heart pumps, you know, that's another wave that's being sent down to your, your, um, your blood vessels. And so it's constantly happening. So you have kind of waves that are constantly coming forward, waves that are constantly coming back, you know, and they're, they're interacting with each other in, in different ways. Um, and kind of there, there's, there's a couple net effects for, for this. And, it, and it, it all depends on how, how far you are from the heart. Because uh, if you can imagine, you know, you're far away from the heart, say you're like right next to the capillaries, you know, you, the wave reflects and it comes back and you, you feel the reflected wave right away um, compared to, you know, it takes a while for the reflected wave to come back towards the heart. And so kind of the first effect that you see is that if you're farther away from the heart, I guess, I guess we can kind of lump them both together to one. So they, essentially they're, they're going to affect the, the pressure wave that you, um, that you observe. The pressure waveform, or in other words, the, the blood pressure that you that you measure at that part. Right, the, so the pressure waveform will have a higher it will it'll have a higher peak. Yeah, that's because of the the one that's bouncing back from the capillaries, right? Exactly. Right. Okay. Because the thing with the reflected waves is as after the wave reflects and as the reflected wave travels back up your, your cardiovascular tree, it kind of starts to die down as, as it travels. Because eventually, you know, the, it's, it's not like a ping pong thing in, in, your, in your blood vessels where it's like wave, 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 you know, because otherwise, you know, we, we kind of just explode because eventually, you know, those waves have to kind of die down. And so, you know, because and so by the time you get back to it gets back to the heart, it's, it's mostly kind of died down by, by that point. But right next, but right next to the capillaries, or right next to right after it bounces, you know that's that's where you kind of see it most pronounced. Um, and so that's that's the main that's uh, one thing. And so you know um, you have a higher peak pressure, and then that peak pressure will also be slightly delayed. Right. 
And so if I draw kind of, um, you know, a typical pressure waveform, so, you know, say that we have um, an area next to the heart it might look something like this, right? It's a really bad drawing, but it's okay. Um, and so if you compare it to a pressure waveform far away from the heart, it's probably gonna look something more like this. And so it, it eventually decays down to the same value here, right? Um, but the peak you can see is higher and it's also slightly delayed. So it happens a little bit later compared to um, somewhere close to the heart. And these are kind of the, the net effects of all the, of all the wave propagation. Yeah, cool, thank you. That, that cleared up a lot. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, it's 5.30, so let's go ahead and uh, get started today. All right, good, uh, good evening, everyone. How's everyone, how's everyone doing today? 
Doing well. Studying for tests. Good, good. Yeah, uh, I know uh, Isaac has uh, one of my midterms tomorrow too. So I know uh, this is a this is a busy week for everyone. So uh, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I know you know uh, things things really start to ramp up in, in a hurry for for you guys and you know with the lectures being recorded and all being virtual. So I think um, you know it's it's very easy I think to to kind of just you know skip lecture and come watch and go watch the recording later. So I just want to take a minute just to say you know I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, you know. Um, at least virtually and, and, and coming to the lectures because, um, you know, at least in my, my experience from college when uh, whenever a lecture was recorded like this, you know, sometimes it might be that only maybe like three or four students would show up to the lecture. So the fact that you guys are all here, uh, at least virtually, you know, it, it, it does mean a lot to me. You know, I just want to say I really appreciate that. Uh, okay. And so today we're going to be starting a, a new subject. And so uh, we're going to be starting um, this, um, this whole idea of lump parameter modeling. And so this is exciting because this is kind of, uh, I think, probably the first, um, you know, real modeling technique that we're that we're going to go over in this class. And so, you know, we'll see how we can actually use these lump parameter models to um, actually represent blood flow and actually solve for their solutions in, in MATLAB. And so, um, you know, I really like this unit because I think it, it kind of is just kind of by itself kind of a good kind of microcosm for, for this class where, you know, we take something, um, you know, biological and, you know, very complex in nature. We build a computational model for it so that we can actually solve for it, and then we actually implement its solution in, in MATLAB. And so here you kind of kind of see you know end to end, kind of a, a, on a really small scale, kind of what we're doing with with Simvascular. Okay, and so I will I will warn you that you know a big part of lump parameter modeling um, is circuits, and so um, you know I, I do know that you guys take a circuits class, so you know um, and so dust off the old circuits textbooks. We're going to be using we're going to be using it a lot. Uh, and so, you know, I know everyone has different feeling. They, everyone feels a certain kind of way about about circuits. But you know, hopefully by the end of, of this week, um, you'll feel a little bit better about circuits because uh, you'll see that you can actually use them to model blood flow in a very kind of interesting application. Right? Okay. And so, besides that, I think we have we have a homework that's due tonight, and so that's uh, homework two. And so that's that's the homework with you know the vast majority of them are uh, just short answer questions. And so uh, make sure you turn that in tonight if you haven't done so already. Okay. Uh, and so are there um, are there any questions on that or uh, any questions on um, anything I can answer before we uh, we start today? Okay. All right. And so uh, and so you know I do have the next homework prepped. And so the next homework assignment is going to be um, based on lump parameter modeling. Uh, and I believe it's going to be due next Friday. And so we have a little bit over a week to to do it, okay? Um, and it's uh, it's it's um, it's going to be you know fair, fairly lengthy too. So definitely you know um, at least take start taking a look at it and and you know and start working on it. And, and it's going to involve kind of everything. So it's going to involve you know um, so there's going to be some hand calculations as we derive the equations, and there's also going to be a big MATLAB component too as you solve these systems in, in MATLAB as well. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, um, midterm. So our midterm is not going to be for a couple weeks, and so I, I don't want to, um, you know, talk about it too much until then, because I know I know you guys probably have enough to worry about in terms of midterms. Uh, but we still have a couple weeks for this class, so our midterm is not going to be until week eight, and so we'll probably discuss it a lot more uh, next week. Okay, and so let's uh, let's get started with lump parameter modeling. Okay, and so the the the, um, the acronym that we'll give for this is LPM. All right, so you'll you'll hear me use that a lot, and actually in, in my mind that's that's kind of what I've associated this to be, um, and we'll kind of break down what uh, what it really means. Okay, uh, and so for the for the last couple of weeks, you know, we've been going over those lecture notes on arterial biomechanics, and so now at this point, you know, we have a good understanding of you know what are the certain things that we should look for in the cardiovascular system, right? And so we talk about things like, you know, what are the flow waveforms look like? What are the pressure waveforms look like? You know, what is the idea of, um, of, uh, of wave propagation? You know, what is it? What does the wall shear stress mean? You know, what is mechanical transduction? And so, you know, at this point, you know, we kind of have a good idea of how blood should behave, you know, at least generally its physical behavior inside the cardiovascular system, okay? Um, and so um, that's great. Uh, but as engineers, you know, before, you know, um, um, so that we can actually, you know, start designing for these systems, we need to create a model for it. 
And you know, we might have gone over what a model is at some point earlier in this in the semester, but let me kind of um, you know mention it again. And so a model is is basically a uh, some kind of um, representation of a physical um, phenomenon. Okay. And so usually models are, are mathematical in nature. So usually, you know, you'll, you'll hear physicists, you'll hear engineers talk about models. What they mean basically is a set of equations or maybe a set of, uh, of um, or maybe a mathematical framework through which to represent a, a physical reality, okay? Um, and so modeling is extremely important because what modeling allows us to do is it allows us to use basically math and equations and computers um, to perform experiments, um, you know, to represent reality without having to actually do something in, in reality, okay? And so anytime you do any kind of design work, right? And so if you think about SOLIDWORKS, you know, SOLIDWORKS is a model, right? So in SOLIDWORKS, you build a geometric model, which is a, which is a digital representation of some physical object that either already exists or you might, you might be machining, you know, maybe sometime next week. Okay? And so the term model is, is very, very broad. It's going to mean a lot of different things, okay? And so I kind of lied a little bit when I said earlier that, you know, this lump parameter modeling is the first model that we're going to be looking at because we've actually already seen a model, right? And so in this class, you know, a model that we've already used is our Navier-Stokes equations. Because okay. in Navier-Stokes, you know, what are we, you know, what are, what are they essentially? And so your Navier-Stokes are basically a differential equation or a mathematical representation um, of how a fluid will behave, you know, in a certain environment. Right? And so your Navier-Stokes equations are our model that we've already used. Okay? Uh, but if you remember, you know, back when we were going over Navier-Stokes, um, uh, you should remember that Navier-Stokes is insanely complicated, and you know, we we can't solve for Navier-Stokes in 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 like uh, in most you know practical situations. Okay. And so even though Navier-Stokes counts as a model, um, in a lot of situations, it's, it's not the most useful model because it's, um, you know, it's just really complicated to solve. Okay. And so that kind of, you know, um, drives the need for a more simple model that we can use to uh, model blood flow. And in fact, there there is one, and uh, you know this is uh, relatively as, as simple as it gets. Okay, and the the model that we're going to choose for this is we're going to use um, circuits and circuit elements um, to model that blood flow. Right, so, so schematically, we're going to be doing like this, right? So let's say that we have a blood vessel in the human body, and let's say that it's it's bifurcating like this, right? So we have blood coming in, and blood going out just like that, okay? Uh, when we model this as a lump parameter model, we're basically going to say that, you know, instead of solving for, you know, the Navier-Stokes equations in this, uh, in this bifurcating vessel, what we're going to do instead is let's let's say let's replace this with a circuit okay so let's say we have one circuit like that maybe it's another circuit like that okay right and so let's replace that um, that fluid mechanic situation with this circuit here, and then uh, instead of solving that um, you know that Navier-Stokes problems, let's solve this electric circuit. Um, let's solve this electric circuit instead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ben's uh, Ben's reaction is kind of what I what I expected because I know uh, um, I've I've kind of talked to you know some of you guys over the past couple of years, and I know everyone feels a certain kind of way about circuits. But hopefully, you you feel a little bit better about circuits from um, after this class. Okay. All right, because the benefit that we get from circuits is that, believe it or not, circuits are actually in, a lot more simple um, to solve 
um, than the full Navier-Stokes equations, okay? And the reason this is, is, um, you know, um, that I'll outline on the next page. Okay? And another reason that we like circuits is that they, there's actually a lot of very analogous um, components of circuits that, you know, um, connects well with all of the expected behaviors in the cardiovascular system, okay? Because the thing with models is, is this. So, so, you know, if you look at kind of the catalog of all different models out there, there's, there's a million models under the sun, right? Um, but a lot of them are really crappy models uh, because in order to be a good model, um, you know, it needs to represent the, it needs to represent all the features of the physical situation that you're, that you're trying to emulate basically, right? And so with blood flow, you know, with blood flow, we have a lot of stuff going on, right? We spent like, you know, the last few weeks talking about that, right? And so our model needs to be able to capture all of those, you know, um, important features. So it needs to capture, you know, the, the flow and pressure waveforms correctly. It needs to capture wave propagation. It needs to capture, you know, wall shear stress, right? And so a good model will be able to capture all of these things. And even though the circuit model, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, it's, it's not the most perfect model, but for, you know, but for what it takes to, um, to derive it and what it takes to solve it, it gives you a lot of bang for your buck. And so there's, you know, for the amount of effort that you put in to actually solve it, especially in terms of computational effort, you can actually get a lot of really useful and a lot of really um, interesting solutions from, from this that, um, that actually closely mimic what you see in, in reality. And so we're, this, this whole week is basically going to be, uh, you know, um, uh, another crash course in circuits. And so if you don't remember anything about circuits, that's totally fine. You know, I'm going to basically take everything from, from scratch. Okay, so any questions on, on this? <laughs> you can't escape circuits. Circuits are too, uh, circuits are too useful to, uh, uh, to completely avoid. Yeah. Okay. And so let's, uh, um, you know, let's, let's talk about why, you know, this electric circuit makes a, it makes a good model. Okay. And so why do lump parameter models or LPMs, why are, why are they such good models? Okay. okay. And so the first reason for this is, is that their um, their governing equations are actually relatively um, are, are, re are relatively straightforward, right? And the reason for this is that their governing equations are just ordinary differential equations. And the key word here is, is ordinary, right? Um, because if you compare that to Navier-Stokes, remember Navier-Stokes is a partial differential equation and partial differential equations, you know, just if I can curse for a little bit are, 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 are a fucking bitch to solve, okay? Um, and so a lot of times you, you don't wanna be solving partial differential equations because you know, you're gonna be wasting a lot of time. But ordinary differential equations, you, know, you, can, you can solve those things. And, and what you'll see and what we'll see in MATLAB is that MATLAB has a lot of really nice built-in functions to solve um, you know, ordinary differential equations for you. And so you know, I know differential equations is, is already you know, sounding a little bit scary, you know, but MATLAB, and MATLAB is gonna do most of the work for us. And so what you'll see later is all we have to do is basically set the problem up for MATLAB and then MATLAB will basically take it from take it from there. Okay, and so the fact that we have ordinary differential equations is is a huge, a huge, huge benefit for this. All right, and so the second um, and so the second advantage for LPM uh, is that you know all the circuit elements that you that you probably know and maybe hate, right? So things like resistors and things like capacitors and things like inductors, um, all of these have like a very very close correla physical correlation to the fluid mechanics in, in blood flow. Hang on for a second. Okay. 
And so what you'll see in, in the next section, yeah, <laughs> I, already fed, I already fed her, but the cat was trying to get fed again. Um, and so what you'll see in the next section is we're, we're gonna be going over all the different circuit elements um, and we'll talk about um, what physical or how they can represent fluid mechanics, you know, in a, in a very kind of elegant way. And so there's almost like a very one-to-one -one correlation from between, you know, the fluid mechanics of blood flow or this particular feature um, of a uh, of blood flow and what the circuit element that is needed to basically represent that, okay? Okay, and so before we do that, let's let's talk about some of the downsides because they're, because uh, LPM is not a, it's not perfect. And so, you know, um, you know, you can almost think of it, you know, we're, we're kind of starting this class with LPM and we're going to, you know, we're going to you know, talk about more complex um, modeling techniques all from here. And so LPM is kind of the, the simplest one. And kind of the big weakness is that you lose a lot of the spatial resolution in your solution. Because what you'll see is that um, you know once we construct our circuits, we'll only be able to co compute you know flows and pressures at discrete locations in our circuit. So it might be only like two or three locations depending on the complexity of the circuit. Um, but if you have a very complicated you know blood um, branching tree, you know you, sometimes you might want the pressure at every single location in your in your tree, and and with LPMs it, it's kind of impossible to to do that. There is viscosity in in, uh, in electric circuits, and we'll and we'll talk about that. Um, um, we'll talk about that next. Um, and so that's that's kind of the, the big thing. Right? And so with that loss in spatial resolution, unfortunately, this means that, you know, we won't be able to compute wall shear stress uh, very accurately. Because uh, with wall shear stress, what you need really is you need the the um, the gradient of the velocity near the vessel wall, and with LPMs, that's just impossible to get because you know we're not going to be computing velocities. What you'll see is we're just going to be getting flow values, and so you you can compute it. There is a way to compute the uh, the wall shear stress. It's just not. It's just going to be pretty inaccurate. Um, it'll get you within the right ballpark, but you know a lot of times the wall shear stress you want to be pretty accurate for that. You know if you want to draw any kind of medical conclusion. And so LPNs is, is probably not gonna be the tool that you're gonna need for, um, for that. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, and so let's talk about the, the circuit element. So I'm just gonna focus on three of them mostly for this class. And so we're gonna focus on resistors, um, capacitors and inductors. And so we'll talk about, you know, we'll, we'll do a brief reminder of what their equations are um, and what they actually physically represent. And so, you know, uh, with this section here, you know, um, not only, you know, uh, do I want you guys to take away the the, equa the governing equations for these circuit elements, but I want you to really kind of draw that connection between electric circuits and, you know, fluid mechanics, okay? Because um, there is there is kind of a direct correlation here. Okay. All right. So let's start. Let's start with the resistor, the humble resistor. Okay. Right. And so resistors, you know, these are uh, fairly common, um, you know, circuit elements. Probably the, one of the first ones that you um, that you learn. Okay. Um, and it's denoted by a kind of a little wavy line. Right? And then what you probably know about resistors is that if you apply a voltage difference on the resistor, okay, and so let's say that we have V1 and V2, okay, and if V1 
is greater than V2, right? And so we have a higher voltage um, on the left side of the resistor. What that's going to do is gonna, it's going to drive a current. I had a, I had a brain fart. I forgot the, the symbol for current. Uh, the current is going to drive a current on the resistor, uh, which has a symbol I, which I just remembered down. Okay. Okay. And so um, the physical quantity that this represents for fluids is actually a viscous uh, resistance. And so if we draw the analogous situation with the with a blood vessel, right? So say that we have a cylindrical blood vessel, um, instead of voltage, what you have instead is pressures, right? And so let's say that we have a pressure difference here. We have P1 and P2, right? And so P1 is greater than P2, right? What's gonna happen is that's, it's that, that's gonna drive flow down the vessel, right? And so you can see here, we have kind of a one-to-one -one correlation where you know, on the on the electrical side we have a voltage drop, but on the fluid side we have a pressure drop, um, and on the on the circuit side we have a current, and on the um, fluid side we have a flow rate. Okay. Right. Okay. And so just like we just like we do for circuits, um, we can we can draw out the uh, the governing equation for this. And so for resistors, you know, we have the very famous Ohm's law. And so Ohm's law um, basically says that you know if you have a difference in pressure, a difference in voltage, right? So we have delta V. This is going to be equal to the current um, that goes through the resistor multiplied by the resistance itself. Okay. And so just like that, we can we can come up with a kind of a, an analogous Ohm's law for fluid flow. And so there's there's no name for this, so we'll, I'll call it Ohm's law two electric boogaloo. And so for fluid mechanics, we have uh, basically this. And so instead of delta V, what we have is delta P, okay? And instead of current, we're gonna have flow, okay? And then our concept of the resistor is gonna be the same. And so we can um, basically just have this uh, resistance that just looks like that, okay? Okay. And so there's, you know, there's this kind of one-to-one -one correlation between what you see for Ohm's law and the fluid mechanics um, representation. All right, but when I led this section, I basically says that resistors, they model viscosity, right? So where does, so where does viscosity come into this? Because we haven't really talked about it. Okay. And so viscosity is actually going to factor into our, our value of the resistance. Okay. And so if you can imagine, you know, you have a fluid with a high viscosity, those fluids are going to have a higher value of resistance. Okay. All right. And if you actually think about it, you know, we've, we've actually seen this, um, you know, uh, this concept of resistance before. And so remember when we were doing Murray's law, you know, we, we actually computed this, this resistance, right? And so that resistance that we saw back then was eight times mu times L divided by pi R squared, R to the fourth. And so what you can see here is that the resistance that a uh, that a blood vessel um, you know imparts onto the blood it depends uh, first of all on the viscosity and so that's why we have that mu there, but it also depends on the geometry of the blood vessel as well. So it's going to depend on the length and it's going to depend on the radius. Okay. And so we can go ahead and plug that um, uh, expression in for the resistance, and then we can get our um, you know our our expression up um, up there. Okay. All right. Any questions on resistors so far? Okay. All right, and so if we plug that value in for resistance, then we then we then we get a familiar formula um, that that uh, you know that we looked at when we talked about Navier-Stokes, right? And so we have delta P is equal to eight mu L divided by 
pi r to the fourth times t. Okay. And so, you know, if you have, this is actually a resistor is kind of one of the rare ones where if you actually know the geometry of your vessel, um, and so you know the resist, you know the radius, you know the length, and you know the viscosity, you can actually compute a resistance value. Okay. And so this guy. Right? And so you can actually compute the resistance for, for any blood vessel in your body. Because a lot of times, you know, you know the viscosity of blood most of the time, um, and you know the, uh, and you can measure the radius and you can measure the length, okay? But for this, but for this week, um, I'm gonna keep things simple and I'm, I'm not gonna put it in terms of this. I'm just gonna keep it in terms of, of R, okay? Because it's just a lot simpler just to write out, you know, R instead of this this um, this expression here. Right? And so for this class, you know, we're going to be working with this. So we have delta P is equal to Q, Q times R. Okay. Uh, we're all uh, we're I'll be providing you, you know, the R values most of the time, um, or you know, you might be tuning them later on. Okay. And so we'll we'll go over what tuning means probably um, probably on Thursday. Okay. Right. Uh, or Put it in another way and say that this is equal to P1 minus P2 is equal to Q times R. And so these here are our resistance equations. Uh, but I, I bring up that uh, I bring up our old lecture on Murray's law just to just to um, just to show you that this resistance does actually represent something physical um, and that you can actually compute it. Uh, but for this, but you know, for this, for this week, we, we're gonna have enough on our plates, um, and so you know, I'm just going to keep it as just a, a resistance value. Okay. Okay. So that's resistance, uh, and I will say that resistance is probably one of the most important things in in cardiovascular flow, especially especially for the smaller vessels like capillaries. Um, but that's not the only physical feature that we need to model. Right? And so let's move on to the next circuit element, which are capacitors. Okay. Okay. And so in electric circuits, uh, capacitors have the unique ability to temporarily store electric charge. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, the symbol for capacitors looks something like this. Right? And so you have basically two parallel plates, um, and then the wires come and come off them, right? And so if you remember from your circuits class, you know what happens with a capacitor is that current comes in, okay? And then when the current comes in, you know it it doesn't go through the capacitor right away. What it some of it actually goes towards filling the capacitor with charge. And so, um, you know, if we kind of extract from this a little bit, capacitors are really good at modeling storage, right? Storage of stuff. And so what does this look like? Or, you know, uh, if we think back to, you know, what, what do blood vessels tend to do? You know, blood vessels tend to do something very similar, right? And so we have a blood vessel like this, right? And you have blood that kind of flows into this blood vessel, right? What do we know about blood vessels? We know that blood vessels are not rigid tubes, they're flexible, right? And so when a blood, and so when you flow 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 blood into a flexible tube, that tube can kind of expand, right? Okay. And so of course that's a, that's an exaggeration, but um, but basically you can have a, a a tube that kind of expands and inflates, okay, uh, due to the flow that comes in. Right? Or in other words, you know what we're saying is that because the blood vessels are flexible, what they can do is they can temporarily store blood. And so once again, we have kind of this this one to one correlation with you know something that we know happens in in blood vessels, and we've and we've been able to find a circuit element that kind of represents this um, very very well. Okay, 
And so if you think back to last week, you know, we talked a lot about that, that whole Windcastle uh, model, right? And so that Windcastle basically was, um, you can almost think of it like a water balloon, a pump, and then, you know, some, um, some channels that model resistance, right? And so capacitor basically models that kind of, it's kind of like the same thing, right? Uh, but instead of a water balloon, now we have a, a capacitor that kind of, that kind of does that. And so capacitors in kind of in a nutshell, basically they're used to model the fact that blood vessels are flexible and can store flow. All right, any questions on, on this before we write out the equations for, um, for capacitors? Okay. All right. And so the equations for the capacitor um, looks like this. And so for capacitors, we're going to have a, um, a differential equation. And so we're going to have a equation for the time rate of change of pressure. And then what we're going to say is that this can be equal to 1 over C, where C is the capacitance value multiplied by Q. And then Q right here is the flow into the capacitor. Okay. Right, so relatively simple. And just uh, just as another um, you know um, trivia with uh, with capacitances, um, you know you might you might hear this term you know especially if you go hunting in the literature. Another name for a capacitor in in the context of of blood flow is compliance. And then we'll uh, once we once we start doing examples, you'll see you know how this is actually um, implemented in, in practice. Okay, so that's capacitors, and so you can see capacitors play a, a very big role um, in modeling blood flow as well, because you know otherwise we'd have no way to model kind of the, the flexible wall nature of it. Okay, right, and finally we have inductors. And so inductors, if you kind of remember, they look like this little coily coil. Okay. And what inductors represent um, is they represent the inertia of blood. Um, and think about what inertia means. So, and so inertia, um, if you remember, is the tendency for an object to resist changes in motion. And so just to kind of draw an, an analogy, so let's say that you have, you know, let's say that you have your, your couch that's on your, um, that's on your living room floor, right? And you want to move the couch from one side of the living room to the other. And so to do that, you push the couch, right? And so, you know, what you should feel immediately is that when you push the couch, you know, the couch is going to kind of push back on you, right? Because the couch is, is not going to want to move. And so it's just want to, it wants to kind of keep its motion state, um, you know, um, and due to its inertia, basically, right? And so same thing if you have like a, like a baseball that's being thrown at you, right? So a baseball that's being thrown, it's in motion and you try to stop it, right? It's gonna take a little bit of time for the, for the motion of that ball to stop, right? Because, you know, an object that's in motion wants to stay in, in motion, right? And so blood's no different. And so blood is, is the same way. When you try to, you know, try to change its motion or you try to, you know, make it flow, 
there's going to be a little bit of, of initial resistance because, you know, just because, you know, it has mass and it takes, it takes a lot of energy to get mass going. Okay. And so, um, you know, the way that um, this manifests itself into an equation basically says that, you know, it takes a little bit of time um, to get the blood flowing okay? uh, when you apply it to, when you apply a pressure difference. And so basically what's happening in every heartbeat is that when your heart um, pumps, you know, you have that pressure gradient that goes throughout your, your blood vessels, right? So you have high pressure near the heart and low pressures near your, your capillaries, right? And so, you know, it, it, it might be kind of hard to see with kind of the naked eye, but as soon as your, your blood pumps, right, that their blood doesn't immediately, all, all the blood doesn't immediately say, all right, let's, let's get going, guys. And so it takes kind of a, a split second for the blood to kind of get moving after you apply that, um, that pressure difference to it, okay? And so the, the equation that, that governs the uh, inductor looks like this, okay? And so we're gonna have an equation for the time rate of change of the flow, okay? All right, and so we're gonna have dq dt, where q is the flow that's on the inductor. And then we're gonna have that equal to one over L. And then we're gonna multiply that by the pressure difference on the inductor, okay? All right, and so there's there's our three circuit elements, and so you know there's there's more out there, and so there's there's diodes and, and things like that, but you know just for this class, I'm going to focus on these three, because to me, like these three kind of form the kind of the essential three um, components that that you know that needs to be a part of of most LPNs. Okay. All right, any questions on this before we uh, um, we talk about um, deriving LPN equations? Okay. All right, and so now that we've we've been introduced to all the circuit elements and what they physically represent, um, let's put these guys together into into circuits and actually derive its its equations. And so when I say deriving LPM equations, um, LPM equations, what I mean by that is you know, a lot of times you'll be given or you'll be designing a circuit that represents, you know, a certain part of your vasculature. And then from there, what you need to do is you need to find um, the, the differential equations that governs its behaviors. And so to do this, you know, um, we're going to obviously use the equations that we just looked that we just, you know, went through uh, just now, uh, but you're also going to need to rely on a lot of the fundamental circuit laws as well, right? And so, you know, I'm, this is a little bit of a crapshoot, but um, did you guys learn about Kirchhoff's laws, um, you know, in your, in your previous circuits classes? Like Kirchhoff's voltage rule, Kirchhoff's current rule. Great. Excellent. Yes, so we're going to use it again, um, but you know, if you forgot it, it's okay. You know, we're uh, I'm going to go over it uh, again, kind of from from scratch, um, and hopefully in a less painful way than than you've than you've learned it before. Okay, okay, and so let's uh, you know, I think the best way to kind of do this is to kind of do a, a worked uh, a worked example, and so let's let's do a simple LPM and let's see how we actually derive the the equations for. It. Okay. All right, and so let's consider the following LPM. Um, where this LPM is uh, basically going to represent our um, our Windcastle model. Okay. Okay. All 
And so you can think of this as kind of the circuit representation of that Winn-Kessel experiment that we talked about last week. And so schematically, it looks something like this. And so we're going to have a wire that comes in. And this wire is going to split. And let's say that we have a resistor that looks like this. And we have a capacitor that looks like that. And then this um, circuit then rejoins. And then we have a ground. OK. OK. And so let's put some parameters on here. So let's say that our resistor has a resistance R. Our capacitance has a capacitance um, C. Okay. This right here is going to be a pressure. Right? In particular, we'll call this PC because this is going to be the pressure that's on our capacitor. Okay. And then coming into here, you know, what you'll, you know, if you kind of remember the wind castle from last week, you know, another part of it was the pump. Um, and so we don't have the pump here, but, you know, we're going to, so we're going to put the effects of the pump in kind of the same way. And so uh, what we have instead is we're going to have Q of T. Whereas Q of T here is going to be the inlet flow. You can almost think of that Q of T as like a boundary condition to our to our LPN model. Okay. All right. And so in addition to that, you know, we have this um, this symbol right here. And so this symbol right here is ground. Okay. And all ground basically means is that, you know, if you kind of remember from your circuits class, ground means you know your voltage is zero there. Um, but you know, since we're doing fluid mechanics instead of voltage, you know, we're going to put pressure. Okay? And so whenever you see a ground symbol, you can basically say that pressure at this location is going to be zero. Okay. All right. And so I'm going to leave everything in symbols at, at this point, but you can plug in values and you can plug in functions for these, you know, very, very easily. Right. And so let's, uh, let's go about um, deriving the, um, the equation um, that governs this LPN. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, um, there's, 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 you know, a lot of ways you can do this. Um, but, you know, here's, here's kind of um, the method that I typically use. So the, the first thing that I do when I, when I come across an LPN circuit like this is I count uh, the number of resistors and the numbers, I mean, the numbers of inductors and the numbers of capacitors. And the reason we do this is, uh, is this will tell us how many differential equations that we need to solve for. OK. Um, because if you remember, you know, our equation for the resistor, our, our resistor equation was simply just Ohm's law, right? And so that was that was an algebraic expression. And so our resistor is not going to create a, a differential equation. I mean, we're, we're definitely going to use that. Um, but in terms of, you know, differential equations, it's only going to be based on the numbers of inductors and capacitors there are. Okay. And so in this particular case, we have one capacitor. And so we're only going to need to solve for uh, for one equation. Okay. Does that kind of make sense to everyone about uh, you know why we, we count those those stuff? Okay. Any questions on on this before we uh, continue with the example? Okay. All right. And so here uh, from here, um, you know, you're, we're going to need to start applying the circuit laws in order to help us derive the equations. Okay. And which circuit and in which circuit law that you um, actually apply, um, you know, is is going to be different in each case. But I, I will tell you that you know the one that we end up using more um, is Kirchhoff's um, current law. And 
And I always forget how to spell Kirchhoff's name. I'm still going to spell it wrong. So I, I've always known it as Kirchhoff's current law, but I know sometimes it's called uh, the, the, the junction rule or the joint rule. Okay. Basically, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to look at the joints into, in, our, uh, in, in our circuit. And basically, whenever the flow splits off into two, into, into two. Okay. Or in other words, you know, we're going to be looking at the bifurcations in our uh, in our lump parameter circuit. And, and essentially what we're going to be doing is at these joints or at these junction points, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be applying conservation of mass. Okay. Okay. Um, and so conservation of mass and Kirchhoff's current law and the junction rule, you know, they all basically mean the same thing. And so whenever you have a junction, basically what it says that um, the amount of flow coming in has to equal the amount of flow coming out. And so let's see how let's see how to apply this, you know, for our um, simple example here, right? And so the junction that I'm going to apply it to is is this kind of upstream junction right here, okay? And so at this junction, what we have here is we have um, the inward flow that comes in, right? And then that flow is going to be split. And so some of that flow is going to go to the resistor, and some of that flow is going to go to the capacitor, okay? And so let me go ahead and draw the schematic for this. Right. And so we have a situation that looks like this. And then coming into the circuit, we have the inlet flow, right? So we have Q of T, um, and that was you know, provided by the, the problem. Okay. And then coming out of here, we have two flows, right? So we have QR, and this is the flow that's gonna be going over the resistor. And then we have QC as well, and that's the flow going over the capacitor, okay? And then by Kirchhoff's current, um, current law, or conservation of mass, or whatever heck you wanna call it, you know, we're basically going to say that the, um, you know, the incoming the incoming flow, which in this case we only have one source of incoming flow, which is Q of T, right? This has to equal all of the outgoing flows. Okay. Right. And that's it, right? And so that's uh, that's basically what we're we're going to be applying. Churchyard. <laughs> yeah. Is not not the easiest uh, name to say, um, and it's even more difficult to spell. Okay. All right. And so what we've done is we've we basically just applied conservation of mass and said that flow coming in has to equal flow coming out. Okay. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to take these expressions for QR and QC, and then we're going to replace these with the uh, governing equations for the resistor and the capacitor. All right, and so um, you know, if you if you look back and kind of in the notes for our circuit elements, you know, we'll have expressions for uh, for both of these. Okay. All right, any questions on um, on this? Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and plug in for those. Right. And so for the resistor. Remember for the resistor, we had. Can you, go, uh, can you go back 
like oh, yeah. I missed the one little last part. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You uh, you good? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, and so remember for the resistor, our governing equation here was um, was Ohm's law, or I guess you know um, the fluids version of Ohm's law, which is Ohm's law two um, electric boogaloo, right? And so for the resistor, we had delta P is equal to Q times R. Okay. But we want to manipulate this expression so that we we solve for Q, right? And so if we divide both sides by R, what we have is Q sub R is equal to delta P divided by R, okay? Okay. Uh, and so that's the equation on the resistor, um, but let's go ahead and, and replace this delta P with, uh, with something, right? And so remember what delta P represents. Delta P is the pressure drop um, on the resistor, right? So it's basically the difference between the upstream pressure and the downstream pressure. And so let's look back at our circuit and then let's see what the upstream um, pressure and the downstream pressures are, okay? Okay. And so if we come back to the circuit, we can see that upstream of this resistor, you know, we have this pressure right here, P sub C, okay? right? And so that's the pressure upstream of the resistor. And since it's connected by simply just a wire, Remember, everything connected with the wire here is, is, is at the same um, level of pressure or the same voltage, okay? And so since we have PC right here, then, you know, the upstream pressure on the resistor is going to be PC, right? And then downstream of the resistor, what we have here is this ground, right? And so ground is going to be at zero pressure. And so if we say that delta P is equal to P1 minus P2, okay, where, you know, if we have our resistor right here, right, so we have P1, P2, okay. And this particular problem, P1 here is gonna be equal to PC and P2 here is just gonna be equal to zero because that's where, that's where the ground is, right? And so what we get is QR is equal to P sub C divided by R. And then what we can do from here is we can just plug that back into our um, back into our expression. Okay. All right. And so that's the resistor. And now let's do the capacitor. And so the capacitor. Uh, remember, our equation for the capacitor was dP dt is equal to 1 over C times Q, Q going into the capacitor. So I'll call it Q sub C, okay? And so we can solve this equation for Q, right? And so we have Q sub C is equal to C times dP dt, okay? Right. And now that we have that, we can go ahead and plug this, uh, plug this guy back in. And then we will um, have our differential equation. Okay. Right. Any questions on uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and, and plug that and plug that in. And so if we plug in that into our expression, we have Q of t is equal to Q um, Q R. And so we just solve for Q R. And so Q R is going to be um, P over R plus QC, which is going to be C times DP DT, okay? Right. And so usually what usually what we do from here, I mean, this, this is perfectly fine. And so you can, um, this, is, this is a perfectly acceptable differential equation. But usually what we like to do is we like to isolate just the derivative term. And actually, you know, when we go in and implement this in MATLAB, um, this actually makes it a bit more convenient too, okay? 
And so if we solve for this derivative term, we're going to um, subtract p over r from both sides and divide by c, right? And then what we get is dp dt is equal to q of t divided by c minus p over r c. Okay. And this right here is our differential equation. Professor? Yep. So this is our differential equation for this particular example, right? But it could be different for another example. Exactly, right. And so, you know, what I want you to focus on for, for these is not the equations themselves, um, but just the, the method that we went um, went through to derive these, these equations. Yeah. Because uh, okay. depending on the circuit, you know, your equations are, are going to be different. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, question. So can we say that um, Kirchhoff's current law is similar to conservation of mass for fluids at a bifurcation? Absolutely. Yeah, they're actually, you know, exactly the same thing. And so they're they're exactly analogous. Yeah. And so, um, you know, just because just because I, I struggle to spell Kirchhoff, I, I'm, and I, so I'm going to avoid saying it and writing it down. So uh, from here on, you'll probably hear me call it conservation of mass from, from here on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so here is our um, differential equation. And so, uh, you know, right now, obviously, we can't solve for it because we, uh, we don't know the values of R and C, and we don't know the values of Q, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, in order to actually solve this, you have to plug in something, at least something for Q, right? And, uh, and I'll say that, you know, we'll, we'll go over typical values of R and C later on, um, but I do want to make a comment on Q. And so usually, you know, and you know, what we usually use in this class are, are sinusoidal functions for, for Q. Okay. Uh, and the reason we pick sinusoidal functions is, um, remember, uh, blood flow is um, pulsatile, right? And so it's, it has waves to it, right? And kind of the simplest mathematical function that has those kinds of you know repeating behavior are sines and cosine functions. And so you know uh, what you'll see you know for these examples and what you'll see in the homeworks is that you know um, I'll I'll be using sinusoids a lot for these. So and so you know does it um, exactly uh, mimic or exactly model blood flow of waveforms? No. So it, it's uh, you know it's it's not not quite the same as what you'll see in blood flow. But it, at least it's better than like a it's better than a polynomial because at least a sinusoid will come back you know, come back to its, its origin eventually, okay? And so even though sinusoids, they're, they're not the best, they at least have that pulsatile behavior that we, that we want to see, okay? Okay, uh, and so for in this particular equation, uh, and for this particular example, you know, since it's a, a one-dimensional, um, you know, we only have one ODE, we can actually solve this by hand, um, you know, given that we knew Q of T. So, you know, you can use um, integrating factors, you can use, you know, other stuff, uh, but basically, we're able to get a closed form solution for P of T. And so I'm not going to expect you to do this in this class because it's, you know, um, it's, it's called computational for a region. So, you know, for a lot of these, we're going to make the computer do all the work. Uh, but in case you wanted to take this solution here and actually, you know, um, you know, write out the function for it. Here's here's what it is. But you know, um, you don't you don't have to remember what integrating factors are are for this class. Okay. But I, I'm just letting you know that you you can solve it with integrating factors. Okay. And so our function here is going to be p of t is equal to e to the minus t over r c times integral from zero to t of q of tau where tau here is just a dummy variable. And so it's just a, a, a variable that we're gonna integrate over. Okay. Plus the initial condition P of zero. Okay. Okay. And so, in, you know, in this case, you know, since we just had one ODE, you know, we could solve it by hand and there's there's no real need to bring MATLAB into it. Uh, but next let's do an example where we have a more complicated set of equations um, that we need to use MATLAB for, okay? And so, you know, we have 15 minutes left. And so the plan for, for today is, uh, you know, let's derive the equations for, for this, uh, for this next example. 
And then starting on um, Thursday, I'll show you how to implement it in, in MATLAB, okay? All right, so any questions on, on this before we, we jump to the next, uh, next page? The full full name for Ohm's Law 2. So it's, it's not an official name. So that's, that's just the name that I gave it. And so it's Ohm's Law 2 uh, Electric Boogaloo. That's not that's not the real thing. So don't don't go to another professor and say that I, I said that because um, they Wait, might. Wait, what's uh, what's the last two words of that? Electric Boogaloo. So it's it's kind of a meme name because I think it's there's a there's a sequel to some movie you know back back in the 80s or something like that, and they called it Electric Boogaloo, uh, and it was <laughs> apparently it was really bad or something like that. I, I, I don't I don't know the full history of the meme, but I, I, I see it on on Reddit a lot. So yeah. that's funny. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and do a, a, a slightly more complicated example, and let's do let's throw an inductor in there. Okay. All right, so this is going to be example two. Okay. And the thing and the thing with these LPMs is that they're you know um, deriving these equations. It, it's it's unfortunately more of an art than it is uh, science. And so, you know, um, what what you might what you might the feeling that you might get from after this week is, you know, we'll do the examples in the class, and you know, you might say, okay, yeah, I, I kind of understand how to do that, and then you'll get to the homework, and you might have no idea what to what to do, and so that's that's totally normal, and so you know, unfortunately, the kind of the best thing that I can do for for you in this situation is to, is just to try to give you as many examples as I can. So I think the more examples that you see from this, you know, the better, the better, and the better intuition that you get for for solving these these circuits. And so, you know, I do want to do as, as many examples as as I can. Uh, and in fact, you know, at the end of this, um, at the end of these lecture notes, um, you know, I do have some notes on how you can do a, a, a actually model a heart with lump parameters. But I might I might um, change that to just one more example with um, LPMs, just just to kind of give you a lot of a lot of exposure. Because with these, you just you just need to see a lot of circuits, and then you kind of get used to to working with them. Okay, and so this this next example we're going to do uh, one step up, and so we're going to take our same circuit from last time, uh, but we're we're going to add an inductor upstream of up, upstream of the bifurcation. Okay. And so here we're going to have our inductor. Okay. Then our flow is going to split, okay. where we have our resistor there. And then we have our capacitor, and then we have our ground, just like last time. Okay, and so let's label some of these um, some of these quantities. And so we're going to have our inductor has an inductance of L. Our resistor has a resistance of R. Our capacitor is C. Okay, and let's label the um, the unknowns that we need to solve for. Okay? All right. So just like last time, we're gonna we're gonna have this pressure at this junction be PC. And so that's that, that's basically going to be the upstream pressure on the capacitor, okay? And so that's why I call it PC. And the the other thing that we're going to need to solve for is we're going to need to solve for the flow on the inductor. Okay? Okay, and so this is going to be QL. Okay? And then at the inlet to our LPM here, we're going to have an inlet pressure. Okay, so we're going to have PI of T. All right, and so just like last time, we're going to take this circuit here and we're going to derive the set of ordinary differential equations that govern its behavior. Okay. And so in this case, you know, since we have, um, you know, uh, an inductor and a capacitor, here we're going to have multiple differential equations. Okay. Oh, and, and since we're going to be implementing this in MATLAB, let me give you a functional form for PI of T. Okay. Although we're not going to use it today, we're going to use it um, on Thursday. And so let's say that PI of T is going to be 20 sine of pi T plus 100. And so it's basically a sinusoid that's going to vary in between 80 and 120. Okay? And so it's basically like the same as 120 over 80 pressure. Okay. okay. And so we're going to start this, um, you know, the same way as we did last time. And so first thing we're going to do, we're going to count all the inductors and capacitors. Okay. 
And this is going to tell us, uh, remember, this is going to tell us the number of equations that we need to solve for um, or derive from this, um, from this LPM. Okay. And so from the circuit, you can, you can see that we have one inductor and one capacitor. And so combined, uh, we're going to have two, um, two ODEs that we need to solve for. Okay. Right. And so we're going to have one ODE that goes on the inductor and another ODE on the capacitor. Okay. All right. And so next, let's um, let's uh, derive the differential equations okay, using our circuit laws. Okay, uh, circuit laws, and if if applicable, uh, we could just ap directly apply our um, circuit element governing equations. Oh, it's a freaking moth in my in my room. Okay, and so in fact, let's start with the inductor because actually we have we have everything we need to get the ODE on the inductor uh, without without having to apply any um, Kirchhoff's laws. I guess technically this is this is a a voltage law because you know we're going to be finding the pressure drop, uh, but it fits basically directly into our inductor equation. Okay, and so if you recall from earlier in the lecture. Um, the equation that governs the inductor looks like this, right? So we have dQ dt, right? And so the time rate of change of the flow on the inductor is equal to 1 over L times the pressure drop on the inductor, right? And so the inlet pressure um, minus the outlet pressure. And so, uh, with this in mind, let's let's take our inductor here from the um, from the circuit, and let's see if we can find out what the inlet pressure in is is and the outlet pressure, right? uh, or I should say the upstream and the downstream pressure. Okay, and in this case, we do. And so, if you look at kind of the left hand side of the inductor, we have P I of T, and so we have the upstream pressure because that's that's just simply our inlet pressure, and then downstream of the inductor, we actually have the um, pressure on the capacitor, which is the same as, you know, um, the downstream pressure on the inductor. And so all we have to do is basically just apply these two pressures and plug them into this formula here in order to get our ODE for the, for the inductor. Okay. Um, all right. Any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and plug that in. And so we have dql um, dt is equal to 1 over L um, times, uh, we have the upstream pressure here. So the upstream pressure is pi, or our inlet pressure of T, minus our downstream pressure, which is pc. Okay. Right. And so just like that, we have our first uh, ODE. And so, if you if you have kind of a layup in your OD in your in your circuits, you know you have basically everything you need. You know, take that take those layups because they they don't they don't come that often. And so, you know, this is a case where we can kind of directly apply, you know, that that inductor equation, kind of get an ODE kind of um, almost automatically. Okay. okay, so that's our equation on the inductor, and now let's now we need to work from the equation for the capacitor. Um, and luckily for this, this actually mimics um, very closely the situation that we had in the last example. And to just kind of refresh your memory, what we're going to do is we're going to apply uh, conservation of mass to that junction where the where the vessel is bifurcating. Okay. And so let me draw that junction again. 
And so our junction looks like this, okay? And then just like before, we're gonna have a, a flow on the resistor here. So that's gonna be QR. And we're also gonna have a flow on the uh, capacitor, capacitor, which is gonna be QC. Okay? And luckily these have the same um, values as what they did before, right? And so QR, if you remember, we used our Ohm's law for this. And so this is gonna be um, PC divided by R. And then QC is going to be C times C times DPC DT. Okay. And so those those have the exact same expressions as as before. Okay. And then coming into this um, uh, coming into this junction here, what we have um, is not QI anymore because we don't have an inlet flow, um, but all the flow that comes into this uh, junction here has to come from the inductor, right? And so the flow that comes in is actually gonna be Q sub L here. Okay. Right. And so if we form the equation for conservation of mass, we have Q sub L coming in is equal to PC divided by R plus C DPC DT, okay? And then we can solve this equation for DPC dt, okay? And then we get dpc dt is equal to uh, one over c q sub l minus pc divided by r. And if we call this uh, equation one, and we call this equation two, um, here we're uh, we're done. Okay. All right. And so at this point, you know, we've derived our two differential equations that govern this uh, this ODE. Okay. Or govern this. Uh, we've given, we've derived our two ODEs that govern this circuit. Okay. And what you should notice is that these these equations are going to be you know they're a lot more difficult to solve for right because we no longer have one un, we no longer have one unknown uh, we actually have two now right because we have uh, basically QL and PC are unknowns okay? and even worse you know what you can see is that these equations are uh, what we call coupled okay? and so the solution to one equation is required for the solution to the other one okay because look at this top equation here okay? for the inductor. Right. What you see in this equation is PC, right? And so we need PC in order to solve for, for this one, right? But we don't know PC because PC, what we know about it is we know it's differential equation DPC DT, okay? Uh, but in the equation for DPC DT, what you have is QL, right? But we don't have QL. What we have is DQL DT. And so when you, whenever you have a situation like this, where you have a system of differential equations and the solution of one equation um, depends on the solution of another one and vice versa, uh, what we call is that we, we call these equations are coupled. Okay. And this makes them, you know, not impossible, but, but um, I would say really annoying to solve by hand. And so what we'll do on Thursday is we'll take this system of ODEs here um, and then we'll learn how to solve it in, in MATLAB. Okay. Uh, but before I let you go today, I, I do wanna make one more, one more point um, that will make your um, deriving of ODEs simpler, okay? Uh, and, what you'll, and what I want you to remember is that um, generally whenever you have an inductor um, in your um, LPM, and so you have an, L, uh, an inductor in your, in your circuit, what you're going to do is you're going to end up getting a differential equation for the flow on that inductor, okay? And that's exactly what we have up here, right? And so for that, on that inductor, we ended up with a differential equation for QL, which is the flow on that inductor, okay? And so this is this is generally true. And so uh, whenever you have an inductor, you know, just expect that you're going to have some DQ DT, okay? Whereas for the capacitor, generally what you'll find for the capacitor is you'll you'll find an expression for um, the, um, the, the derivative of the pressure on that capacitor. And that's exactly what we have down there. Okay? 
And so back in step one, when you count the number of inductors and capacitors, right, you can take this another step and you can say that, you know, I have one inductor here. And so that tells me that I should have one differential equation for the flow, right? And then I have another um, capacitor in here. And so that tells me I should find a differential equation for the pressure on that capacitor, okay? And so inductor means flow, capacitor means uh, pressure, right? And so I, I want you guys to kind of keep that in mind as, you know, especially as you start to work through the homework, uh, which I'll probably post tomorrow. All right, any final questions on this before we, uh, we wrap up for today? All right. All right. So if there's no more questions. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, and uh, call it a day. And so thank you guys for tuning in as um, as usual. And then we'll pick this up on Thursday from with MATLAB. So have a great evening, everyone. Um, good luck with midterms if you have them this week. And I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks, guys. Professor. Yep. What's up? Um, Professor Wang, he uh, does the same thing uh, with heat transfer. I have him for heat transfer this semester. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he applies uh, the, uh, basically the, the uh, uh, Ohm's law to heat transfer. And basically he uses uh, heat transfer Q is equal to the change of temperature over the resistance. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, he does that. And I, I, it's pretty, pretty interesting how how circuits can be applied both to fluid mechanics and also heat transfer. Yeah, yeah, circuits circuits make a big, uh, big, a big thing in, in heat transfer as well. Um, and you can, I, I, I think in, in 407, you'll focus mostly on just thermal resistances, um, but you can actually use capac capacitors and inductors have, have a place in heat transfer as well. Um, although us usually it's, it's uh, um, not covered in, in an introductory heat transfer class, but yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a good reason you learn circuits in, uh, as part of your engineering uh, curriculum. So I remember when I first learned circuits, I was like, why am I learning this as, as a mechanical engineer? Um, but then you start to see the applications in a lot of different fields. It's like, oh, wow, you know, circuits are actually, um, you know, they, they help a lot. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. And I was comparing it. So I was, you said that the only downfall of this model is that we're going to lose spatial something. Yeah, spatial resolution. Spatial yep. resolution. Okay. Yeah, because I was trying to see the uh, Nav Navier-Stokes equation, and you know how it compares to like uh, what, like you said, the spatial is basically like the x, y, and z terms. Yep. Mm -hmm. and so it's just going to be time dependent, like a time dependent equation. Yes. Example. Yeah. So so with LPMs, we 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 will be able to find time dependent stuff. Uh, but you can see, you know, there's there's no there's no real concept of space here, and so yeah. you know we're going to be solving for q. And we're going to solving for p, but those are only at two like kind of fixed locations in our circuit, um, because a lot of times what you want is if you have like a, a blood vessel like like say like like this right. What we want to what we want to find out more is like how does the pressure evolve as we go from this this location, maybe down here right, and so we don't we don't want this at discrete points we want it like all throughout this all throughout this path. And with LPMs, that that's impossible unless unless you put in like a ton of circuit elements, mm. uh, which I've seen people do. I've seen people put in just like a bajillion capacitors and, and resistors, but then you're kind of you know you're kind of defeating the purpose of an LPM, uh, which is you know you're making it too complicated to to solve. With. <laughs> I see. So, um, so in this, so because of, it's difficult to solve Navier-Stokes, we use these LPMs to help us kind of simplify things. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so if but if you have a powerful computer, like you can solve Navier Stokes with like a CFD program like like in Synvascular, 
uh, but even in CFD programs, like you'll see LPMs um, actually make a make a make an appearance there too, because on our three D simulations, we need to apply um, boundary conditions on there, and so we need to apply um, basically conditions at the inlets and the outlets. And actually, a very natural way to supply those are actually to use LPM models for that. And so, for for all your projects, you'll see that you'll at the very least you'll be using what's called a resistance boundary condition, uh, which which will utilize you know some of your knowledge here. Mm. And uh, are are we going to be using this to kind of calculate the wall shear stress on our on it by any like uh, what what would what's uh, sim in electric circuits? What's the similarity to shear stress on our in a circuit? Right, and so in circuits, there 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 is no concept of wall shear stress at all. And so mm -hmm. that's why for a circuit, you know, this, that's, that's the other big weakness is that you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, you can come up with a, uh, um, with, a, with, with an approximation though. Um, it wouldn't, it, it's not that accurate, but it at least gets you in the right ballpark. Uh, and the way that you do that is you actually use your uh, resistors for it. Because right. on this resistor, if you know the amount of flow on this resistor, Right, which is which you know after you solve an LPM is is not that difficult to to solve for usually, and so you might either have it explicitly or you might you know you might have just have to take a difference in pressure. Uh, what you can do from that flow is you can you can assume um, you can assume basically that you have a perfectly cylindrical vessel, and that the and that the velocity profile here is parabolic, right? and so it's it's a lot of assumptions, uh, but if you if you make these assumptions and you and you basically you know solve for that velocity distribution with the same Q. Um, then from that velocity distribution, you can compute basically the wall shear stress, which is gonna be based on the gradients of velocity next to the wall. Yeah. And so you'd, you'd have to make a lot of assumptions and, and you know, sometimes those assumptions are fair, um, but you know, usually the more assumptions that you make, the, the farther away that you get from the, from the real solution. All right, thank you, professor. Yep, no problem. Have a good night. Thanks, you too.